so they can be poured into by their pastor. Amen. Amen. And so they're going to be with us tonight. Also, uh, well, let's just get right into the word. Uh, lift your Bibles out. Let's make our confession of faith. Let's somebody say surge. Yeah. Look at the neighbor. Say that's what you're in. Look at the other neighbor. I didn't like their response. Say the other one. Tell them say that's what you're in. I didn't like their response either. Try somebody totally different. Tell them say that's what you're in. I didn't like their response either. Maybe the fourth one is it. Tell somebody else, say, you are in a surge. Tell them, say, that's what you're in. Now see how they respond to that. I didn't really like theirs either. Go to the fifth one. Five is the number of grace and favor. Go to them. Tell them, say, you are in a surge. Tell them, say, that's what you're in. Now see what their response is. Ah. Somebody holler it out. Hallelujah. Lift your Bibles out. Let's make our confession of faith together. I am unconditionally loved by God and that harvest. I come to him just as I am, but I won't stay as I am because the message I'm prepared to receive will make me more like the great I am. I am blessed and I am favored in Jesus' name. Remain standing. I want you to go to Psalm 133. Tonight, I want to teach you part two of where we were this weekend. Say, my surge is in my unity. Say it again. Say, my surge uh, is in my unity. Now, if you came on Wednesday night, I, asked, I, I presuppose that you came thirsty. I presuppose you came hungry. And you ought to be glad when you come to a church where you can leave full. Uh, Psalm 133, verse 1, a song of a sense of David. Say, say this is a surge song. Verse 1, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren. Look at your neighbor. Say, he's talking to you and he. And I wasn't good English to say, say he's talking to you and I. Uh -huh. how, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion for there. Somebody say there. Well, where is there? Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon represents unity. So, so where? There. Where is there? Mount Hermon. What's Mount Hermon? Unity. For in unity the Lord commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. Father, I decrease that you might increase. Speak to us now that we would move and walk in everything that you've ordained for us. I pray that you would open the ears of your people to hear what the Spirit is saying to us tonight, Father. And I pray that they wouldn't just hear it, but they would have a grace to go do it. I pray that they wouldn't just sit back and say, that's good, Bishop, but they'd get up and do something with the good that they heard. I pray that the Spirit of do is on them tonight. D-O, to get something done, that they would move and walk in what you have ordained. I call them out of complacency. I call them out of lack. I call them out of passivity and speak them to the king that's on the inside of them and command them to rise up and to rule and to reign and to conquer and to subdue as you have ordained. And it is in Jesus name we pray. Somebody shout hallelujah. As you take your seats up, I have two or three people tell them your surge is in your unity. Your surge is in your unity. I'm going to move right into this. Uh, in this series we've been learning some simple, somebody say simple, Biblical principles that can create surges, which are sudden, powerful, forward or upward movements in every area of our lives. Now, so far, I've taught you four simple principles. The first was your surges in your strengths. The second was your surges in your strategic prayer. The third was that your surge was in your praise. And this past weekend, we began expounding upon this thought that your surge is in your unity. Say unity. Now, Psalm 133 is a song of ascent, which means to go to a higher point and to go from the inferior to the superior. Somebody say, that's a surge. Please understand, a surge means you were at the bottom, and then all of a sudden you're at the top. A surge means you were at the end of the line, and all of a sudden somehow you can't explain it. You don't know how it happened. You're at the beginning of the line. A surge is all of a sudden it looked like you were being overcome, but now you're overcoming. A surge is where you look like you were being conquered, but now you are more than a conqueror. I wish you'd touch your neighbor and say, that's what we are. We are surge. That's why every time you got knocked down, something you got back up because the living, breathing surge whose name is Jesus the Christ lives on the inside of you. I, I wish you'd touch your neighbor, tell him, say, you are surge. God help me in here. Now watch this. The word unity we learn means, watch this, one. And the result of unity is a commanded blessing. So we learned in part one that wherever there is unity, there is a surge. Say, where there is unity, 
there is a surge. I don't like how y'all are talking to me because you're talking too slow and you're talking too low. I need you to bring up your volume, pump up the volume. Say, my surge is in a unit, is in unity. That'll work. Does your neighbor say, that'll work. Now watch this. In part one, we examine unity first in an individual context and then in a corporate context. And so tonight, uh, I want to review them in reverse order. I want to review the corporate context, and then I want to dive deeper into the individual context. Now I need to say this to you. When I review, uh, uh, particularly in any teaching, I do this uh, particularly on a Wednesday night where we're doing a part two. I do that because many in Wednesday night aren't necessarily in the weekend experience and haven't been able to get the CD. So the review uh, is to make sure that everybody's on the same page because the scripture says in all by getting, get an understanding, which means it's not just enough to sit there and shout and, and shake your head. I want to make sure you leave out of here understanding so you can go do something with what you learn. Y'all not hear what I'm saying? If you just want to go to a church where you just sit back and the preacher just gives you a nice, a, a lot of platitudes that really have no practical application, you at the wrong place. But if you want to leave out of here with some, with some tools to go do something and make change in your life, just your neighbor say, you got the right one, baby. Got the right one. Got the right one. All right, now watch this. So let's do some review here real quick. Psalm 133 mentions Mount Hermon, which is a cluster of mountains with three summits in the northernmost point of the promised land. Now watch this. Uh, this is the same place where Jesus took Peter, James, and John, James and John where he transfigured himself. Uh, transfigure means that he uh, stood or went to a higher dimension of the ability in which he was revealed. Let me say it another way. To transfigure yourself, trans, you see there, uh, this prefix of that word trans, we see transform or transpose. So it means to take something that is one thing and to make it another thing. So he transfigured himself. In other words, he changed the way that they saw him, not because he needed to see himself differently, but they needed to see him differently. Sometimes some of the stuff you go through is so that God can transfigure himself to you. It is not that he needs to be bigger to himself. It's just that he needs to be bigger to you. He is great all by himself. He is the great I am. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. But sometimes he's got to take you on Mount Hermon and say, there's more to me you need to see. Because you just say I'm a healer, but you don't know I'm one. So sometimes you'll go through a valley that'll... Tell the neighbor, say, he's transfiguring himself to you. There's some stuff about God you never even knew. Maybe you didn't know that sometimes it was God that initiated some of the problems you run into. That's why I feel like preaching tonight. That's why in Isaiah chapter 45, God says, I create the light and the dark, the good and the evil. Which means there's some stuff that comes against me, but God says, I initiated coming against you because you needed an enemy because that enemy was going to make you pray. That enemy was going to make you worship. That enemy is going to make you praise. Here it is, Isaiah 45, 7. They'll stick it up for you. This is the Lord talking. Touch your neighbor and say, he's transfiguring himself. Which means there's stuff about him you need to see. Now, please understand, somebody in here, you thought God was mad at you, but he had to transfigure himself to show you, no, I'm not mad at you. In fact, I'm very proud of you because you've made a lot of progress. You've grown a lot. Touch your neighbor and say, you've made progress. I right, watch this. This is the same place he took Peter, James, and John to transfigure himself, but it's also the same place where Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that he'd build his church on this rock and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The rock he was talking about, now there's confusion throughout history because he looks at Peter and he says, you are Peter. Now, one translation, he calls him a, a translation in Greek, which means rock. He says, you are the rock and on this rock I build my church. So there was confusion throughout time and in antiquity because people thought that when he said the rock, he was saying, Peter, you are the rock. But the reality is Peter couldn't have been the rock because Peter was one of the first ones to deny him when he had an opportunity. So you can't be a rock if you ain't a rock. You ever have people do you like Peter did Jesus where, you know, all they knew you when you was on top. But the moment you had a little issues in your life, the moment you ran into some trouble in your life, that's why you better thank God for the people that stick with you even when you got mess going on. You better thank God for the people that know all the mess about you and still choose to deal with you and still choose to love you and still choose. So when he says, he says, he says, you are Peter and on this rock, he wasn't saying to Peter, you are the rock. Now it's interesting, what he was doing is he was trying to affirm an identity. Can I teach you tonight? This is Wednesday. He was trying to affirm an identity in Peter because if you just read uh, in the books of your New Testament, you'll find that Peter had three distinct identities or names that he was known by uh, just in the New Testament, which means Peter had an identity crisis, but yet Peter was called to lead, which means sometimes when you're called to lead, one of the first things you got to figure out is who you are. Peter didn't know who he was, so Jesus says to him, you're a rock. Now, you don't act like a rock. 
Uh, you, you're going to have some issues that, uh, what is a rock? Solid, meaning standing on a firm footing. But Jesus speaks to him and says, Peter, you are a rock. Don't you love it? That Jesus looks at us and calls us what we are not. He calls things to be not as though they were. See, the reality is, is that he calls you blessed even if you got a lot of curse going on in your life. He calls you favored even if you feel frustrated. He calls you full of grace even though you ain't got nothing but grief. He calls you the head even though your tail is all up in everything. Would you touch your neighbor and say, thank God that's what he does? He calls things that be not as though they were. He'll look at a failure and say, you're going to be a leader. He'll look at a crackhead and say, you're going to be a deacon. He'll look at an alcoholic and say, you'll serve the man of God. You... What? So I, I got to get here. I got to get here. He looks at Peter and he calls him what he isn't. <laughs> and through time, people thought when he said, Peter, you are Peter and on this rock. They thought that he was saying, Peter, you're the rock I'm going to build my church on. Which is where today in Roman Catholicism now, they, 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 they have a, a certain uh, level of, shall we say, uh, deification, if you will, to make one a deity of Peter, if you will. Not quite a deity, but, but, but tantamount to. Uh, that's the best term that, I can, that I'll use at this time. Because they say, you're the vicar of Christ. Because he said, you're Peter, you're the rock. And on this rock, he's going to build a church. So they said, well, Peter, you are the rock. But no, he was telling Peter, he was affirming Peter and saying, Peter, you, you are a rock. But the rock I'm going to build my church on is the, is the Mount Hermon we're standing on. Now he says, you are a rock, but you're not the rock I'm going to build my church on. He says, touch the neighbor and say, you are a rock. He says, Peter, you are a rock. I'm going to affirm you because I know you need some affirmation because your daddy didn't give it to you. Your mama didn't, didn't give it to you. Your cousins didn't give it to you. So I know you need me to tell you who you are because you walk around asking everybody, but well, do you like this? Well, do you like this? Because you're trying to get somebody to affirm you. So, Peter, I'll tell you who you are. But you're not the rock I'm building my church on. The rock I'm building my church on is the mountain we're standing on. The mountain we're standing on is Mount Hermon which is the same place in Psalm 133 that said, Beloved, it's like the dew of Hermon. T tell your neighbor, say, it's unity. So when Jesus said, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it, the rock was what? Mount Hermon, which means Jesus built his church on what? Unity. And because of that unity, hell cannot prevail against the church. Well, let me remind you what you learned in part one. Who the church? We are. Which means hell can throw its biggest, its baddest, and its best. But since you're unified on Mount Hermon, touch your neighbor and say, hell cannot prevail. Sickness can't work. Disease can't work. Money problems can't work. Marriage problems can't work. Family problems can't work. Microphone problems can't work. It won't work. Why? Because hell cannot prevail against the and what rock did he build it on? Unity. That's why I feel it here now. That's why the scripture says a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, by the process of deductive logic, what does that teach us? A house that is unified can stand, will stand, always stands, and will stand against whatever stands against it. That's why people can get unified about something wrong but still get stuff changed. Yep. Okay, look, 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 I'm moving fast. I'm going to make sure you get this. Touch your neighbor and say, it's going to be good. You ever have people on your job dead wrong, but they got a co-signer? And when they got a co-signer, now two dead wrong folk are getting policies changed. And you're sitting and saying, well, now, wait a minute. This is the policy. This is the way it's supposed to go down. Unity is so powerful that even when you're wrong, if you're unified, a surge happens. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Unity is so powerful. And if church folk would get an understanding of this, you stop talking about I'm offended. To hell with your offense. You know why you're offended? Because you think somebody up in here owe you something. You know why you're offended? Because you didn't come to serve Jesus. You came to be served. You came for somebody to know your name. You came to be big and bad. Well, baby, this ain't about you. This is about the king of and all the offended people sitting there looking like they don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to stay home. I'm offended. But you know what? You should. Because don't bring that disunity up in the door. You need to check your flesh. You know what ego means? Edging God out. Every time you get caught up in your flesh and caught up in your ego, God leaves so that you can run the show. 
I'm teaching now. Test your neighbor say, no disunity in this house. That was the wrong neighbor. I didn't like how they said it. Test the other neighbor say, no disunity in this house. And matter of fact, let me tell you something. If you got disunity in your house, some of y'all need to go home and say, let me tell you something. You got until Friday morning to get you some unity. And either you get unified as for me and my house, we a bishop, that's my son. But if he bringing disunity, it's the reason you ain't got no surge in your house. You better say, son, you got until Friday morning to get yourself in order. And if you ain't in order, how am I going to pay all the bills and you run something? I don't pay and beg. Okay. Okay, I apologize. I I hope I didn't offend anyone. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. And so tonight, everyone, hallelujah. Come on, let me get the Denver preacher. Hallelujah, everyone. Hallelujah, everyone. Glory to Jesus, everyone. <laughs> Tell the neighbor, say, no disunity in my house. So even in the church, watch this. Don't, don't allow the enemy to ever get you in disunity. But how come so-and-so didn't say hi? Maybe they didn't see you. Maybe it's no conspiracy that everybody is trying to put against you to not talk to you. Maybe they just didn't see you. It got real quiet right there. Because see, church folk, you know, you know, say, okay, all right, see, I, see, send the mess with the, okay, what's it? Corporately, I talked to you in part one, there's three areas we had to be unified. You remember those three, those three Fs I gave you? What was the first one? Our future. Our future is found in our core values. We're raising up an army of leaders in our church that are history makers and curse breakers. Hear me. And you're here. Say, I'm here. By the divine order of God. Because before time, I was your pastor. And before time, you were my sheep. And before time, there was a harvest. You missed it. Jeremiah chapter 1 teaches us that we, watch this, predated time. Scripture says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I what? Knew you. Which means, watch this, before he had a body, he had a purpose. Mm. Before he had a body, he had an assignment. Mm. Before he had a body, watch this, he was already about handling his business. Now, I need, I need to take this out. I need to take, touch your neighbor and say, we're here by the divine order of God. Tell him, say, this is no accident. I know you think somebody just by happenstance gave you an invite. I know you think just by happenstance you looked it up on the computer. I know by happenstance you think I just found the app. There's no Hebrew word for coincidence. You know what that means? They don't exist. You are here because before time, God looked at me, and then he looked at you. Then he looked at Denver and said, that's what they need. You're not hearing me. He looked at you, and he looked at me, and he looked at this region and said, that's what they need. You're not hearing me. He looked at me, and he looked at you, and he looked at all the problems going on in the world and said, that's what they need. So watch this. And I told you this in part one. It's time for you to get in where you fit in. And in case you didn't know that, let me go on and give you your affirmation. You fit here. Tell your neighbor, say, I fit here. It's a good thing to finally find where home is. Touch your neighbor, say you found it. All right, number two, I told you we have to be unified corporately. I'm gonna deal with individual in a moment, but I wanna deal with this in a corporate context first. Say corporate unity. All right, so secondly was our finances. Say our finances. Say, come on, talk to me now. Now that'll work. See, see, y'all can't be all Denver on me. Second is what? Uh, that'll work. See, I challenge you to be a faithful giver of your tithes, offering, and first fruits. Why? Because he surges the sower. Touch your neighbor and say, he surges the sower. Because 2 Corinthians 9 said he gives seed to the sower, and that when you give a lot, you reap a lot. And then when you're a faithful giver, God will make all grace, the scripture says, abound, which just means come toward uh, you, and he'll make you have an abundance. Say abundance for every good work. Now, here's what that teaches us. That lack isn't from God. Because if the result of my giving is he'll give me an abundance and he'll watch this, give me a harvest that was greater than my seed, stop spiritualize, spiritualizing lack. It is not spiritual. The Lord just teaching me a lesson. Yes, he's teaching you you don't give. Bishop, I do pay my tithes. Right, you owe that. That's not where increase comes from. The offering is what brings increase. The tithe belongs to God. You're not sowing seed by tithing. 
you're paying what you owe him. I knew he'd get quiet right there. I ain't stunned you're quiet. You better say amen to me. Because in, in our church, I don't want anybody lacking. And by the way, since I said my church, let me go and explain that. This is his church by ownership, my church by stewardship, your church by membership. Touch your neighbor say, in our church, nobody lacks, nobody's broke, nobody's jobless. In fact, we are the job creators. I prophesy that in our city, our government officials are going to have to come to our church and say, Bishop, we need you to get some of your people to create some jobs. What's this? What's this? So I don't want anybody in our church struggling. I don't want anybody in our church lacking. Touch your neighbor say anybody. Which means if one of us is, it's a problem. But the solution is to become a faithful giver. Listen, I ain't got number two dollars. Start there. I think I got a few witnesses in here that know that God has a way of even when it looks like there is no way. When you are a faithful giver, won't God open up a door? They said it like this in the Baptist church. Won't he make a way out of no? I think I got some witnesses here. You weren't getting calls back, but when you started giving, all of a sudden you got more offers than you can handle. You watch, watch, watch. And secondly, I told you that your giving to harvest produces the only thing that can, you can take with you when you die, and that's lives that are changed, that made a decision to become a Christian. And I told you this in part one, that your faithful giving empowers your church to reach people you may never speak to or meet, but your giving has changed their lives. And when you stand in front of God, he's not going to ask you about your 401k. He's not going to ask you about your savings. He's not going to ask you about your IRA. He's not going to ask you about your checking account. not going to ask you about your car. not going to ask you about your house. not going to ask you, watch this, even about your spouse. not even going to ask you about your kids. He's going to say, tell me whose life has changed because of you. And when you stand in front of God because you're a faithful giver, you know what heaven's going to do? The angel's going to come in. When you come up, touch your neighbor and say, this is what's going to happen. Now, this is a dramatization. And they're going to be quite like this, but you can get the point. Uh, when you stand in front of God, they're going to start printing stuff. Some of y'all remember them old printers where it went, y'all remember that? Well, but, but let's just pretend they got one of them old printers. And when you step up to the line, now, the person in front of you wasn't a faithful giver. So, so they paper it's going to be, yeah. Ain't nothing here in this folder. But when you get up there, and they're going to say, what is all that noise? That's the lift of everybody who saved, of everybody who didn't commit suicide, of every little girl that didn't lay on her back and become a statistic because you were a faithful giver. Touch your neighbor and say, show you right. But then number three, I'm just reviewing. I told you we had to be unified about what? Fishing. Now, at 11.15, we had to have Prince's Fume. And uh, now at that 9.15, it was miraculous what that boy was doing. I was speaking to him. He was like. But at 11.15, he crossed over. Somebody said, today, somebody said, Bishop, you want us to get you a new one? I said, no. I said, he's going to be an only child. I said, and since he decided to go, that's it. <laughs> and now watch this, watch this, watch this. Say fishing. Jesus told us to be fishers of people, and I gave us a goal for growth, and I'm going to lay this out in a very practical way over the next uh, several months, but we're fishing for 1% of our metro region. And I told you that we fish for people by inviting them to experience our life-giving church. And who should be invited? Anybody and everybody. Now, now watch this. Now, this is very important. Uh, let me tell you. You ready for something? Of why out of everywhere you could be living right now, why you find yourself him. Now, I, I just need to, the only the honest people. And Denver folk, don't be offended when the honest people are honest. How many of you, you're like... You've asked God in the last few years, like, Lord, Denver, come on, Lord. For, gee, come on, be honest. Come on, it's all right. Now, Denver people, don't be offended by that. You love your Denver, and, and, and I love it too. Okay. Amen. Thank God for Denver. 
granola. Swartz on Monday. Parka on Wednesday. I was having lunch with a pastor, and he said, uh, I said, I, tell, I said, Pastor, I said, I li- I like this. I'm liking this weather. I said, this, this will work for me. He said, work. I said, this will work. I said, I like this. I said, this will work. And then we were having bre- breakfast. This morning, I had lunch, breakfast today. And, uh, and he said, Bishop, I was thinking about you because <laughs> it started snowing. And he said, I was just hoping you weren't going to let that uh, <laughs> mess with you at all. <laughs> now, 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 check this out. It, I'm going to tell you why you're here. And even those of you that have been here your whole life, I'm going to tell you why you're here. Touch the going to tell us why we're here. Because, I mean, there's a lot of other cities you could be in. I don't know, different cities you could be in. <laughs> Amen, let me move on. Okay, let me tell you why you find yourself here. And for those of you watching online that aren't here, why God has connected you to Harvest tonight. Let me tell you something. You ready for this? Now, if you don't shout off of this, it's okay, because in a moment I'm going to do what's called an invitation to Christ. And so you, no, I'm serious. And you can give your life to Jesus. Because you may not know the shout because you may not know Jesus yet. And that's okay. But by the time I'm done with this message, you're going to know Jesus. <laughs> Bishop, you're saying if I don't shout out on Jesus, that's exactly what I'm saying about this point I'm getting ready to say. The city of Aurora, it means dawn. And dawn means, watch this, by definition, it is the announcement of the coming of the sun. Now, it's talking S-U-N, but because we believe in Jesus, we live in the place that is the announcement of the coming of the, but it gets better. Aurora means atmospheric phenomenon. Phenomenon means it's unusual and it cannot be easily explained. See, it'd be easy to build a ministry with a global impact in the Bible Belt. But God said to me, son, if you can do it here in what they call the church planter's graveyard, you can do it anywhere. I'm trying to tell you, God placed us here to be a phenomenon. Would you touch your neighbor? Touch him, say, we're something like a phenomenon. Tell him. That was the wrong neighbor. Try the other one. Tell him, say, we're something like a phenomenon. It don't make no sense how he's done what he's done, but he's done it because we are the phenomenon. And they go look and say, that came out of Denver? That came out of Aurora? How? But I know some of you think, well, Bishop, I live on the other side of Parker, so technically I live in Denver. I'm glad you said that. Denver means valley. And implied in the definition of valley is that the valley was once green. In fact, you even see that portion of the definition in communities in the city named Green Valley Ranch. Well, that came from the definition of the word, which meant the valley used to be green. And then I started thinking about Ezekiel. The Lord placed Ezekiel in a valley. Oh, y'all not going to say nothing. Let me just make it real plain. Now, I'm not just a church planner, but by God's grace, I've experienced phenomenal success through the years in business as an entrepreneur. But over the last nine years from when we planted our church from scratch, I've often felt like Ezekiel. I'm not saying I'm him. No, no, I'm not saying that. I said, I felt like him, no, because the Lord set him in a valley. He didn't choose to be in the valley, but the Lord set him in a valley. And he said, now, son, can these dry bones? live and so I started looking at being the phenomena and I started looking at being in the valley that was once green and rather than complaining about what's in the valley I started speaking to the valley I'm trying to tell you the reason you live here ain't just because your family go here and your school no you're here because you're connected to this Mount Hermon Because God says, I'm going to raise up a people called Harvest that are going to be a phenomenon, that are going to speak to the dry bones in a valley that used to be, that used to be great. I wish you'd look at your neighbor and tell them, Surge, tell them, Surge. 
In fact, some harvesters went out and got me some chucks that say it on there. Look, touch your neighbor and say, we're surging, we're surging, we're surging, we're surging. We're sur get up, close up, get up, close, hurry up. Come on, give me the shot. Give me the shot. Give me the shot. Look, y'all see it say surge on it. Touch your neighbor and say, we're surging. Touch the other one and say, we're surging. The reason you had to be in Denver is because God says there's a bishop forming there and there's a harvest there and you're part of that Mount Hermon. Watch. 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 So there's some dry bones in the valley. But for this reason was I sent. Look, look, look at me. Look at me, everybody. The problems you're complaining about. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. For that reason were you sent. You sitting up complaining about it. You don't understand you were sent to be the solution to it. We need to do something about the you. Shut your mouth because you don't serve in student ministries here. So shut up. We need to do something to have Christian music. You don't even sing here. Shut your mouth. People need to be nice. You're not nice. Shut your mouth. Well, it got real right there. I ain't studying you. I'm Ezekiel, baby. Can these rap hoes live? Are they going to live before I come up out of here? Touch your neighbor and say, you are that solution to that problem. Now, watch this. Y'all ready? So that's corporate. Say corporate. So you had to be in Denver. That's why some of you, the circumstances, like how in the world, how to transfer, how this, how that, how that. Because God said you have to be there. I got seven witnesses. Some of you were looking at trying to move, and all of a sudden now you were like, well, I don't know, 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 I don't know. And for many of you, the reason is, well, Harvest Church, church, I don't want to leave church. Because you had to be here. For this reason was I sent. <laughs> Say unity. All right, now let's deal with unity. We've dealt with it corporately. We're unified about our future, about our finances, about our vision. Jesus wants everybody saved. Everybody. Somebody say everybody. everybody. Now, individually, here's how you obtain unity within yourself. Now watch this. I'm going to start slow because I want you to go with me. But then, about halfway through soul, we're like 100, 120 on the highway. On that stretch of 25, around that corner going to the spring, where you just put it on cruise, but cruise turned into... Max Cruz or, or whatever. You got it? You ready for this? All right, now, now you are, I need you to get this, you are a tripart being. Now, now, now uh, there's, you know, there's been a lot of bad teaching that's going on in the body of Christ. Where people say, Jesus came, you're free from every curse, you're just free. Look at your life, though. Because, I mean, to, 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 to what they're trying to say is that it, you, you don't have to do nothing. And the, and the issue with saying you don't have to do anything is that then you're, you're saying, okay, Lord, will you do something? Because I, w I was taught I don't have to do anything. So since I was taught I don't have to do anything, then there is nothing wrong. So if there's nothing wrong, then you must want it this way. Your spirit got saved. Got it? And you're a tripart being, saying I'm tripart. Trace. Trio, tripart. You are a spirit that has a soul, your mind, thoughts, will, and emotions. You live in a body. I need you to catch this. When you said, in the name of Jesus, I believe you died for me. When you pray that and all that and all that, we can pray that. We're going to do it in a minute. When we pray that, your soul doesn't get saved. Your body doesn't get saved. How do you know? It keeps decaying. Your 
spirit is saved. Now, Bishop, why is it important to understand the difference? I could take you through line by line, precept upon precept, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, get you, I'll just get you right to the point. This is why the Apostle Paul says things like, renew your mind. Well, if it was done when I was saved, I don't have to do it again. See, I don't get saved again. Once I'm saved, the scripture says that he seals me. Then I can be filled. That's a whole other teaching. We're not doing that tonight. But watch that. What, what, what's this? What's this? What's this? You, you don't get re-saved. You recommit to what you already had. The prodigal son didn't re-son. He just went back to being the son he was supposed to be. Do you understand this? Okay, all right. So, so when you became a Christian, the only part of you that got saved was your spirit. The rest of you is still, shall we say, mm, stank. So this is why the Apostle Paul says things like this. You've heard me mention a lot the last several weeks. He said, my flesh... And my spirit, they war. They're at enmity. They hate one another. <laughs> They're at enmity with one another. They, 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 they have a disdain for one another. Well, if all of them were saved, they couldn't have a disdain for one another. I need you to get it. I'm starting slow so you can get it. So the issue many Christians have is that when, when they say, well, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. They think that means that all of them was saved because they are not accounting for the other two parts of them which is why you hear the apostle paul saying things like the right i want to do well what wants to do it my spirit wants to do right but my flesh which there he's speaking generically of his body and his soul which his body is controlled by his soul because his body does what his mind tells him to do so when he says flesh he's talking about the other two parts of him so he says my spirit is versus my flesh because I got the spirit over here but I got my flesh and my soul over here are you getting this? so my spirit's like we serve God but my soul which is telling my flesh my body what to do is like well we don't know if we want to do that my spirit says, I'll bless the Lord at all times. My soul says, but you had a long day at work, though. My spirit says, he's good when I'm up, he's good when I'm down. But my soul says, well, why'd you have to get down if he's good? You're not hearing what I'm saying. They fight with one another. This is why he says, the right I want to do, I don't find myself doing that. But the wrong I don't want to do, why in the heaven do I keep doing that? He says, oh, wretched man that I am. But, but there is a solution. Touch your neighbor and say, there is a solution. The spirit is willing. The flesh is lazy. And the flesh is your soul and your body. Because your body is controlled by your soul. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? So I go real deep there, but I'm just going to stay right here. Now, now watch this. Now, touch your neighbor and say, this is very important. So watch this. If I get unity between all three parts of me, Psalm 133 says he'll command a surge. Watch this. And it's so powerful. Watch this. Even if he doesn't command a surge, which says a promise, but he would, but I just want to know how potent it is. P-O-T-E-N-T, -E how powerful it is. Even if he didn't, because you have unity within you. Matthew 18, 19. Wherever two touch agreeing anything, he didn't say it had to be two separate people. Which means I can agree with me. Any two of you. You're not hearing me. Any two. What, what is he really saying? If we were to take it from an exegetical, hermeneutical standpoint, what he's really saying is, is if I make my spirit line up with my soul, I don't need a prayer partner, although it's good. It's done for me because I had unity within myself. Can I take it another further? So watch this. Here's how you get unity in yourself. Number one, your spirit. 
That's the real you. See this? Ain't you. You're renting this. Which is why you should take care of it because it's not yours. You got to turn this back in. It got real quiet right there. What is this, Bishop? Your body. Your body is on loan. So when you get back to him, it, I know it's going to get quiet here. I ain't studying y'all. I ain't studying you macaroni and cheese, greens, cornbread. I ain't studying y'all. Now he's going to say, now wait a minute now. That's a different size than what I gave to you. I know y'all didn't like it. I'm not studying you. That's why the scripture talks about, that's what the scripture talks about, uh, that we would, would receive new ones. Too deep, not going there tonight. Here's the deal, I'm over time, I got to finish this. So watch this now, watch this. You are a spirit, say I'm a spirit. Now, what does that mean, Bishop? Let me make it very practical for you. That's what in psychology they would call your subconscious conscious mind, that's soul. You have a subconscious mind. And you said, Bishop, why do you do that? Because I, I just, it's below the mind. So it's just, it is, it's not like it's there. I don't want you to think, my I don't want you to think it's there. It's just below the mind. That's why I do that. Now, so your conscious mind, that's part of your soul. Your subconscious mind, that's what would be tantamount to your spirit. But so why is it important to understand that? Because if you go back and get series like the dream series, the scripture, we talked about how your spirit will purge stuff in your dreams. So you got to go get the series. You got to get so much in that series. That was like a 48-disc series. You got to go get that series. Right? In fact, the scripture says that he counsels you in the night seasons or in your, through your dreams. We talked about that. Now, now wh here's why this is important for you to understand this. Say, my subconscious. My subconscious is what I do on autopilot without having to tell myself to do it. You got that? Now, here's why this is important to understand. Oftentimes, we deal with fruit. We don't deal with root, but we don't know where the root actually is. The, roots, the root is in your subconscious. You know why you have that complex about your self-esteem? Because it developed in you when you were a child. So it's second nature to you now. It's your default nature now. Y'all still here? I'm, I'm just walking it. Okay, we almost, we almost do, we're going to get this, but I need you to get this. I want you to get this. Touch your neighbor say, you got to get this. So you know why you think less of yourself than you should? Or more of yourself than you should? It's because it was embedded in your subconscious, your spirit, when you were young. Because nobody taught you what to do with it. It became your default nature. So here's how defaults work. When I don't know what to go to, I go to my default. In the military, they tell you, until you get a new command, go with your last. Isn't that, isn't that what they say, something like that? Go with your last command. So if your spirit's last command is to cuss opposed to pray, not beating you down, I'm just showing you how it works, then your first action is going to be to cuss. Because nobody taught you what I'm getting ready to teach you right now which is how to change the default setting. I just switched uh, my television thing because one coming, I said, y'all are too high. And he said, well, Bishop, we can give you $5 off. I said, $5? I, said, I mean, is this a joke? I'm going to need the owner. So anyway, so I, I got a different, I got a different, different TV. And so, and so we're on the thing, we're doing all this thing. And, uh, and he, can I, can I take my time right here? Are you sure? I'm going to do it either way. I'm just trying to be a good Christian. All right. So watch, watch this. So, so we were on the line, and he was saying, well, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you're, your home's not configured for, for it. There's no active things or something, he said. There's no, no, no. I said, well, listen, son. He said, listen very carefully to me. I said, either it works in the next 30 minutes, or y'all can come get all this. Because <laughs> I, I don't have time for all that. Okay, now you said, Bishop, that's rough. Listen, listen, listen. Don't, don't. I just needed to be what I needed to be. I don't have time for all that. 
And so I said, it needs to work. I said, he said, well, I, th- this, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, what do they be doing when they go in that room in my house in the closet over there? What do they be doing? I said, what do they be doing in that closet? Y- are y'all still with me? Yeah. I said, they be going in that closet and they be messing with stuff to make it work. I said, well, I'm going to go in the closet. I went in the closet. I opened up the thing. I said, well, now, wait a minute here. Let's figure this out. I had the guy on my, th- on my phone here. I said, no, we're going to figure this out. And he said, well, we can get a tech. I said, I don't want no tech, son. I said, you got 30 minutes. <laughs> I don't want no tech. I don't want no tech. I don't want no appointments. I don't want no, I don't want no, I, don't, I do not want to do that. What I'm going to need is this to work. So long, long story short, I'm in there. I said, well, it looks like this goes to this, and they got this three thing in here. And this, long and short of it is, is I went in there and rewired my whole house. <laughs> but I had it working. Now, here's what I'm trying to get you to see. My default mindset, I've been in the process through the years, and I'm still working on it day by day, to shift my mindset from seeing things, watch this, as obstacles, to see them as opportunities. So when he told me there wasn't the ability to do it, I said, well, wait a minute. We haven't tried every way to make it work yet. You're not hearing me. So rather than sitting back and saying, oh, well, I guess we're just going to have to get it. I said, I don't have time for that. I need this to work. You're not hearing me. If some of you would get that way about your life, I'm not just going to lay down and take whatever life throws at me. I... So I go in there, and I, and I started reworking it, and I, <laughs> I reworked it. And he was a nice guy. I told him, I said, you're the most funny customer service person I've ever dealt with. We were on the phone for like an hour or so. And, I, you know, I knew all of this. You know, he told me, about, well, I moved over here. I did this. I used to work here. I did all that. I said, this is great. I said, you're the funniest customer service I ever worked with. Here's the point. Then I had to, to get into the settings. Now I had all my previous settings the way I liked it. It's on auto. The DVR goes. Everything just on auto. I just get home. With that. So I had to reset all of that and take it off of its default. Watch, it took me a long time to reset the defaults. But once I reset them, as long as power stays connected, y'all not hearing me. (laughs) Bishop, what power? That's why when Jesus lives on the inside of you called the Holy Ghost, as long as I stay connected to power, I'm never going to have to reset. All right. So watch this. Touch every cell. Let's reset the defaults. Okay, say it again. Say, let's reset the defaults. Okay, so here it is. Here, how do I reset my defaults? Because real quick for your spirit, I got to move real quick. The first thing is align with logos. Align with logos. L O G O S. Not Legos, logos. Align with logos. Logos is God's written word. Say, align with that. When you read it, reconcile with it. Reconcile, I don't mean in the sense that we think of reconcile like a relationship or something like that or a friendship. No. Uh, If you're reconciling your bank accounts, you're making one set of books line up with the other set of books so that they're right. Got it? So when we read the word, we make our books line up with his book so that the end result is right. I was talking to a pastor today, and he was telling me about a family member. uh, He was having some different issues and things. Y'all okay? I'm telling you a lot of stories tonight. Is that okay? He was telling me, but I just want you to get the point. I want to illustrate it. I'm going to make it demonstrative for you. He was saying he had this, uh, this family member who would always say stuff like, I, I feel that in my spirit. I sense that in the spirit. I just prayed about that in the spirit. And he said to himself, he said, I have a question. Or I don't know if he asked her or said to himself, I don't recall. The question was, he said, how do you sense all that in your spirit, but you don't tithe? Because God ain't saying nothing new until you do what he said that he said. Yeah, I, I know it get quiet right there. This was the question he asked. And I said, I'm saying that in church tonight. No, no, watch this. When we read his word, we reconcile with it. So when you read the word, the word said, forgive those that have hurt you. You know, Lord, I'm going to try. No, you reconcile with it. You make your books line up with his books. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I hate him right now. Don't, just be, don't sit there a minute and then, no, just tell him the truth. Say, Lord, I can't stand him. But you told me to forgive him. So in the name of Jesus, I release this pain, this hurt, this bitterness, and this unforgiveness. I release it. I get it off of me. Are you seeing the point I'm making? We don't, he doesn't negotiate with terrorists concerning the Bible. So you can try to make it say what you want it to say, but it says what it says. And he doesn't negotiate. Doesn't say he doesn't negotiate. 
All right, now watch this, watch this, watch this. Align with it. When you read it, reconcile with it. Why? Because I'm resetting my default of my spirit, my subconscious. I tell it it has to do what the books say. You got that? So the book says I should pray for my enemies. <laughs> now let's be honest. How many of us, we're still in the process of reconciling that one? All right, come on, let's be honest. But the book tells us to do that. So we reconcile with it. Why? Because we reset our default. Because your default may have been somebody do you wrong. You hit me and I'll hit you back. <laughs> Ten times harder than you originally hit me. <laughs> and then I'm going to call the folks on your neck like I don't know what happened in the first place. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm being facetious, guys. I'm being facetious. Are y'all getting the point? I got to move. I'm over time. Are you getting the point? So we, so, so, so we align with his logos. But number two, we align with his rhema, under your spirit, his rhema. Rhema, in the Greek, it means preceding word. I've taught you on it in depth before. Uh, the messages I minister to you, they're God's rhema. It's what God is saying to you. So tonight you're like, Lord, what are you saying to me? He's, he's, he's been talking tonight. I'm not him, but he talks through me. That's Bible. That's Bible. Okay, now watch this. Uh, say alignment. The messages I minister to you come to align you because when you hit potholes in life, just like your car, you get out of alignment. It was fine when you bought it, but because it's been through some rough terrain, it needs an alignment. Does this make sense? So when you come to church, yes, you're coming to be inspired. Yes, you're coming to be encouraged, but you're also coming to be aligned. So I caution you to ever say, you know, I came to church. He wasn't really speaking to me. Well, I don't know if you didn't come here then. <laughs> now, I'm not being pretentious, but I, listen, this ain't, uh, I know, uh, be quiet. Okay. I'm just saying, it's for you. Touch your neighbor and say it's for you. That's important to understand. If you don't know your value on the open market, people will undervalue you all the time. So, so it's not being pretentious, it's just knowing my value on the open market. We've got to know the value of what it is that God's given us to do and to bring. That's why the prophets in the Bible, you didn't just come to them. They said, you need to know my value. So you want to hear from the Lord. Where's your hear from the Lord seed? Now, that's your Bible. See, I knew it'd get quiet. I'm just trying to teach you a point. Okay, let's move to it. Say, align my spirit. All right, so I align with his logos. Then I align with his rhema. So when I come to church, I say, okay, Lord. It's not about what you're trying to say to my neighbor or my kids or my spouse or the person sitting next to me. God, what are you saying to me? So when I'm listening to my bishop, when I'm listening to him, you know, I'm, you know sometimes I'm shouting because I'm like, he, he say that again to them people here. <laughs> no, I'm being facetious. When I listen to him, I'm like, okay, all right, all right, Foreman, okay, all right, okay. Woo. And I'll start repenting in the middle of his preaching. You know, hear me? Cause I don't sit there like, <laughs> no, I'm like, I'm getting aligned. Because as I went through this week, I got out of alignment. So as my man of God's preaching to me, I'm sitting, in, I'm sitting there, well, you got it on a headphone, whatever I'm doing, I'm sitting there and I'm repenting. So when he says that, I'm like, Lord, I show Father in the name of Jesus, please. But while he's preaching. Why? Because I got out of alignment and I need to keep myself in alignment. All right, number two, soul. I told you I was going to go slow, then we're going to pick it up. Everybody understand how to align your spirit? Okay, so when you come to church, you're like, okay, God, what are you saying to me? And then he speaks. And then when he speaks, you know, I need some time to chew on that. No, eat it. Eat that banana. I don't want the banana, but watch your ass for it. That's what I said, eat the banana. That's a southern colloquialism. Uh, <laughs> they give every little kid a banana. The kid takes two bites out of the banana, sets the banana down, don't want to eat the rest of the banana. And then Big Mama come back and say, no, you need to eat that banana. <laughs> I got some witnesses in here. It, ha it happened. There was a young person the other day who did that. And they, did <laughs> and they took one bite out the banana. The banana sitting up there turning brown and black. And then one of the, one of the, one of the ladies came in and said, girl, you better eat that banana. <laughs> All right, now watch this. Say, my spirit, my spirit must be aligned. All right, so number two, here's how you align your soul. Because remember, you're three parts. Now remember, 
the, the body's going to be easy once we take control of the soul. Because your body only does what your mind, either conscious or subconscious, tells it to. You got that? All right, now watch this. Number two, soul. Say my soul. Say it again. Say my soul. Has anybody learned anything? Would you like me to just stop right here and then when we keep going? All right, all right, all right. Here we go. Psalm 23.3. We talked about this in uh, a couple of previous ser uh, series, rather. And he restores my soul. And I taught you this, that if the soul can be restored, then it can also be fragmented. What's the soul? Mind, thoughts, will, and emotions. As you go through life, parts of you get left in the stuff you go through. So the reality is sometimes, parents, the reason why you have fights with your young people is the fights with your young people is because really when you see them, you see the you that you were, that when that part of you got fragmented, and now you see them because they're at the same stage of the you that got fragmented when you got fragmented back then. And so when you look at them, the reason you get so angry when you look at them is because you see the fragmentation of you. And so you're looking at your daughter saying, why is she so naive? But you're really saying that to you. You're going to your son and say, how come he doesn't believe in himself? But you're really saying that to you. Now, watch this. Watch this. He restores my soul, my mind, my thoughts, my will and emotions. I taught you this before. Restore in Hebrew means, but this is so powerful. We're going over it again because I, I, I mean, we need this. It means to break, to build. He breaks me to build me. I'm going to make it make a sense in a minute. In Hebrew, this word means to cut away what's unnecessary. He restores my soul. He cuts away from my mind, thoughts, will, and emotions that which is unnecessary. He cuts it away. How does he cut it away? He allows it to be snatched away, taken away, put away, sent away. It means to dig down to the roots. This word restore. See, when we see restore, restore, we look at it from the generic standpoint and think he's going to put it back together. And while that's a layer or two, in Hebrew, it has a whole other meaning. Are you still here? All right, watch this. It means to cause to submit one's will. Hmm. Bingo. How do, I how do I align my soul, Bishop? How do I do it? It's best to voluntarily submit your will. Or he'll restore it. missed it. You missed it. <laughs> What's this? Touch the neighbor and say, do it, do it voluntarily. Do it voluntarily. Too many. You're spiritual. But somebody you know, the only way they do something is when something is taken from them. People change when they learn enough that they have to, or look that they want to, excuse me, or hurt enough that they have to. Too many of us only change on the backs of pain and hurt. Well, what is the pain and hurt? Restoration. All right, I'm going to go back over it again. We're going to shout in a minute because I got to turn up the gear because I'm way over time. Here we go. Y'all still here? If I don't voluntarily submit my will, what's my will? Wanting to do it my way. Do what's it? Life. If I, don't, that's why in old church they used to say, God won't say yes, just give him a yes. What were they really trying to say? Stop trying to do it your way. Touch when they say, give God a yes. Let's go to the Baptist church for just a moment. Touch when they would say, give God a yes. Tell them, say, give him a yes. Yes in the morning. Yes in the noonday. Yes in the evening. God wants a yeah, yeah. All right, what's this? Okay, that's enough. Watch. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> Y'all going to make me quicker now. Don't play with it now. Now watch. Say give him a yes. All right, here it is. So when we're giving God a yes, what we're saying is, God, your way, not my way. Not the way I want to do it, the way you want me to do it. Are you still here? Are you still here? Now, if I don't do that voluntarily, God says, I'll put the restoration program on. I'll break you, I'll cut away what's unnecessary, I'll dig to the roots, and I'll cause you to submit your will. 
Bishop, how do, how do I make this happen voluntarily? I'm going to give you something super practical. You ready for this? This is super practical. You go, it's not even deep. So for those of you really, it's not even deep. You probably won't shout, woo, or nothing like that. It's easiest to voluntarily submit by creating environments that reinforce the position I want my soul to be in. Let me prove it to you. When you look at your phone, you're seeing an image. Where's the image, where's the image actually come from? Your mind. Got it? So when you look at your phone, your soul is being aligned to something. So what I'm here to tell you is that your phone screensaver is creating an alignment or a disalignment in your soul. When you go to your house, the pictures you have, it got real quiet in the church. Y'all were looking for some Hebrew and Greek. Ain't none of this Hebrew or Greek. Everything I'm looking at in my house is reinforcing an alignment to me. Watch this. So if I still got boxes unpacked for moving six months ago, I'm reinforcing to myself never get rooted. Never get grounded. I'm reinforcing to myself, don't commit to nothing. Don't be serious about nothing. Because when I see it, I see unfinished, which is the reason why you never finish anything because everything around you reinforces a message that you don't finish nothing. I'm saying something tonight. Are you getting this? Okay, at your office, everything in your cube or your office or whatever you have, Maybe you got the whole floor. Everything in there is reinforcing a message to you. And I'm closing because I know I'm over time. But am I helping anybody though? So in your office, if there's nothing there that reinforces to you, you're a king. If there's nothing in there that reinforces to you, you're excellent. If there's nothing in there that reinforces to you, love God, love people, love life. If there's nothing in there that reinforces that alignment... Watch this. Bishop ain't nothing in there but paint. Exactly. Never started nothing. Bare walls. Now you say, Bishop, it's just bare walls. No, it's an alignment of the soul. All right, okay. Thank, just keep praising Jesus, and I promise you, you'll come out on top. Okay, y'all ain't saying nothing. Right? The way you dress is an alignment of the soul. So let me talk to my young lady. Well, no, shoot. And my cougars and my jaguars and everybody else. Say amen to that. <laughs> let me talk to everybody. The way we dress is communicating something. It's, a, it's an alignment of the soul. Are you hearing me? So, so let me speak to my young lady specifically. So if you're dressing to where all your business is in the streets... You are lining to yourself, you're cheap. Which is why all he had to say was, you look nice, okay. Because you told yourself you weren't valuable. So no wonder he can buy you for an extra value meal because you don't even think you're worth that. But as your pastor, I speak it into your life. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the head and not the tail. You... Are you hearing me? So if you want to be a CEO, but you don't dress like a boss, You're sending the message to yourself. You don't deserve to be that because you won't align with that. I can't get nobody to say nothing to me tonight. It's looking like y'all sleeping. Or let, let me go on and just close the message. That's your neighbor say, align your soul. Y'all getting it? So my challenge to you to align your soul it's every environment, you're, every environment I'm in reinforces messages to me. When I go in my home, I have signs like excellence is a lifestyle. To, to align my soul with excellence. 
when I, w- I, I went out so that I, uh, so that I would be, be, in, be thankful to Jesus for my assignment in Denver, I went out and I got all these beautiful canvas pictures of Denver. <laughs> and I got them, and they're in my house. So when I, first thing I see, uh, uh, one of the first things I see when I open my eyes in the morning is the city skyline. Why? Because I want to reinforce our assignment to the region. So the first thing I do is activate Proverbs 11 that says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is established. I'm reinforcing that to myself. Your screensaver on your computer is reinforcing something to you. Why you got pictures of rappers on your screensaver and, and, and R&B artists on your screens and talking about, that's about, you know, that's a little so-and-so. You know what? And you're building their empire while you sitting up here Sure they can sing about bling bling. You paid for it. <laughs> bling bling. <laughs> Go get the single. <laughs> y'all ain't say, okay. All right. I'm okay. Y'all ain't like this kind of teacher. Let me move on. And then your body. Say my body. So that's my challenge to you. Uh, but, but, but that soul, create environments. Your car should, should be aligning you. I'm teaching real long tonight. Is that okay? Your car should be aligning you. And your car, if you got nothing but, you know, you can't even hear what he's saying? Watch this. That's why you never hear God. Because your soul is aligned with loud but not effective. I was, a sub nigga dude came up to, he was driving next to me the other day. <laughs> he, 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 he was driving, and he was driving next to me. And, uh, and, and I think it was on Monday when it was real hot or something. And, and he's driving and he just, <laughs> and I looked at him like, son, you know good well you can't hear. I can't hear what he said. What the boy, what did he say? <laughs> and then when I heard, I said, he ain't saying nothing but A. Hey. Hey. I said, how you sell a million records talking about A? Hey. I thought this was a Christian church, y'all tell me. Watch this. I'm going to hit you because I know a lot of ladies like, tell them, Bishop, tell them, Bishop. But all the work Tamar and Tony them singing about how they hurt and how they mad and how they bitter, no wonder you're that same way because you align your soul with that. <laughs> Nothing against now one of them. I'm sure they're good God-fearing women. Actually, I know what I'm saying. They put, won't he do it on stuff? Okay, what's this? You see what I'm saying to you? So if you listen to these songs, I'm so hurt, I'm so sick and tired of being cheated on, but I'm going to be okay. Cause, well, what? Are you okay or are you hurt? Which one are you? It got real quiet, right? Since they ain't saying nothing, I'm going to press. The clock says I got seven minutes, and I'm going to use every minute one of them. Watch. Watch. Does your neighbor say, align your soul? Your car is aligning your soul. Because if I don't clean it out because I'm waiting on God to give me a new one, a new one's not coming. <laughs> if you can't be faithful with a hoopty, who will make you rule over something else? It's got quiet right there. Because if I don't have a car, if you ain't faithful with your bus pass, shine it up. Put it in a pl- no, I'm saying put it in a plastic case. Cover it up. Be like, no, nah, this, this is, I'm finna get to where I got to go. Because if I had number one suit, iron it up. Work it like a part-time job. What you do is you got to learn how to coordinate. See, what you, what you got to do is so then, so one, first Sunday you wear the whole suit. Next Sunday you wear the slacks with, with one of them shirts that you don't tuck in. With, with, some good, with some good loafers or get you some good, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me, and get you some good monk straps, you follow? Now you got a whole nother outfit. That's week two. Then week three, you do the jacket with another shirt and wear your jeans so you can be business cat. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. And get you a harvest lapel pin and put it right here. And then go get you one of them braces out of there. And th- you got three weeks worth of good. Week number four, you can do the suit again, but with a different shirt and a different tie and a contrasting sock. Oh, I know y'all don't know about them contrasting socks here in Denver, but I'm going to learn you. 
Everybody got it? Align your soul. You feel like David, then good. Get a picture of Goliath's head. Align your soul with that. I'm carrying around my giant's head. Everybody getting this? All right, okay, here it is, body. All right, man, I really, in my mind, this is going to be like a 25-minute teaching. <laughs> is that all right? All right, body. Say, align my body. Now, let's be honest. How many of us, our bodies seem... They, uh, they just, they're under construction in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Now, here's the reality. The Lord was teaching me a lesson over the last few weeks, and this is the last point, and I'm totally done. Um, the Lord was teaching me some of the last few weeks. I was getting, I wasn't really much of a morning kind of person. And, uh, and so, but I began to shift into being a morning kind of, you know, some people just, you know, five o'clock, highly ho, good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm like, let me tell you something. Unless it's an emergency, I don't understand why my phone is ringing. It's like some coffee. No, I don't want no coffee. I don't want a beverage. I don't want nothing. What I want you to do is go back to sleep. <laughs> so I can go back to sleep. So I was trying to align myself to be more of a morning person. And so I was doing that, I was doing that, I was doing that, I was doing that, I was doing that. In the last couple of weeks, just in my times of prayer and, and devotion and command in my day, et cetera, uh, something interesting would happen. I would go to get up. Watch this, because I'm going to teach you a question. I would go to get up, and, it, it, and it'd be like, you know, and I wasn't even tired. But the bed was like, hey, Bishop. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, just another 30 minutes. You're way ahead of schedule. <laughs> Your first meeting ain't until this time. You got some time. I was like, I'm not even tired, though. And then... Do this. The Lord told me, preacher, he said, son. I said, yes, sir, because this is weird. I said, this is weird. Like, I'm not tired. He said, son, I want to teach you something. He said, he said, uh, he, he said, you don't let your body tell you what you feel. You tell it what to do. And then listen to this powerful line. Free flowing and feelings creates failures. Free flowing and feelings creates failures. I feel this, so what? I feel that, so what? Feelings are liars. Bishop, how do you know that? Jeremiah says that your heart, lab, mind, soul controls the body. It's deceitfully wicked above everything. Have you ever felt a way because you were mad, and then once your anger wore off, you didn't feel that way, but you left a war path behind your anger. You don't even feel that way now, but now you left it. You got, you done blew stuff up. And so now you're like, good morning, everybody. And everybody like, I don't want to talk to you. You just walked through here acting crazy, and now I want to walk up. Hey, everybody, I don't want to fool with you. Well, I don't understand. God is forgiving. Yes, but I ain't got to be fellowshipping with you. Forgiveness and fellowship are two different words. Watch this. Watch this. So, so watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. And then I did some studying about my particular, my blood type. And they said that, that one of the things that happens in the mornings is that uh, it says it, all you have to do, and this is so powerful, it said, is just sit up. It, it, I, got, I got medical professors there. For my particular blood type, it said the only thing you have to do to interrupt any of that is just sit up. And when you sit up, my blood type is built, watch this, so that it automatically puts stuff in motion to where I won't want to lay back down. It's built that way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So here's, here, here, now I could preach that several different ways because... Some of the issue you have is that you haven't even gotten up from the mess. You haven't even gotten up from depression, haven't even gotten up from the discouragement. But the point is this. You don't let your body tell you what to feel. You tell it what to feel. So when it says, you don't really need to go to the gym, you say, but wait a minute, unity. 
because it'll start negotiating with you. Just do an extra hour tomorrow. You know, good and doggone well, you ain't going to do it. Because tomorrow happened to be Wednesday. Whoops, can't go. Got to go to church. I'll make it up next week. Oh, shoot. It's so-and-so's birthday. Well, it ain't a good week to do that. Then it's the fourth after that. And then, uh, okay, come on, y'all. I'm done. I'm, I'm getting ready to close. Here's what we do to our bodies. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. And this is even eating. And let me tell you how powerful this is. Today, a harvester, they brought me something in my office today. And my staff did. And, and I said, what is in that bag? <laughs> and they, they brought me. Now, see, I don't mess with sugar. I don't mess with it. Especially white sugar. Refined sugar. If it's white sugar, it ain't right sugar. And you know, it's, it's just not enriched and all that. You know, it's just not good. And so I don't mess with sugar. I just I don't mess with it. Big Bishop did. <laughs> now, had this been a few years ago, you bring me some donuts or some chocolate or some. Oh man, it was on. <laughs> God bless you. Let me have. Let me have some of that. Little Bishop, you know, he tried not to mess with sugar. You know, once a month on special occasions, he'll have a spoonful of something. You know, and so and so and so and so. And so and so, you know, they were like, oh, this is a gift from so-and-so. I said, oh, praise God, that's great. And, and then I let it sit there. I've been doing good, y'all, for going on a long time. I let it sit there. I know it was, it was scandalous. I let it sit there. And, and we had, it was a real full day, real full day, and I let it sit there, and I let it sit there, and I let it sit there, and I was like, well, let me just see what's in there. I opened the bag. <laughs> when I opened the bag, on top, at the bottom was like some cinnamon something, but on top was a chocolate donut. And I said to myself, self, self was like, yes. I was like, the right I want to do. I don't find myself doing, but let me have a bite. And then I'm through with it. I had a bite. I'm like, that's a good donut. And let me have two. And when I finished the whole thing, I said, how in the world did this happen? (laughs) Then it was another one in there. But I said, the devil ain't going to get the victory for me. And so I looked at it. I was like, what is that? And I was like, okay. I said, oh, that looked good. Warm that up with some milk. Ooh-wee. Thank you. So, I, so, so watch. I pulled a little bit of it off. No, just a little bit. No, just a little bit. And th- No, I'm not doing no second CD. Y'all going to have to get the point. No, we're getting it. Here. And I pulled a little bit off, and I ate it. And then when I ate it, I was like, okay, this is too much. The devil is a lie. Satan is not getting the victory out of my life today. I took that bag out of my office with the rest of that other donut in there. I walked it down to an undisclosed location. I put it where I needed to put it. I walked back to my office and drank about seven gallons of water and said, I'm going to flush it out. I'm going to flush it out. I'm going to flush it out. Now, I'm being facetious. I'm being funny, but I want you to get the point. I want you to get the point. The point is this. First Corinthians 927. Here's what we do to our bodies. But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself would become disqualified. Watch this. With that donut, I'm using a simple illustration. Now, the reality is I don't have sugar that often, so no, it, it, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a big deal. But I just don't like having sugar. If I was going to use my sugar, I wanted to use it for a specific kind of dessert. <laughs> I was going to use my sugar allowance. I didn't use my whole March sugar allowance for that donut and peace. Here's the point. Say discipline. You make your body do what it's supposed to do. So your body says another 30 minutes. You say no. 
get up. Bishop, that's simple. I know. I know. But if I, we don't get alignment, we don't see surge. Okay? We've talked about the gym, uh, uh, whatever it is. Some of you, you got, you got, you're procrastinators. And you're like, I'm going to get, now I get to it on Friday night. I know it's due Saturday morning, but I'm going to get to it on Friday night because, you know, I, can, I, li I like the pressure. I like pressure. I just like to push. No. You procrastinate on stuff. And you've missed open doors behind procrastination. Because anybody said, don't procrastinate. You make your body sit down and do what it needs to do. So if you're a student and the paper's due in the morning, you talk about, oh, I'm going to wait to have the church. Tonight happened to be the night where the Lord wanted to speak for an extra few minutes tonight. <laughs> And you 20 minutes short tonight. Your essay preparation time. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You discipline yourself. When you want to call somebody and read them. Y'all know what this is, don't you? Let me tell you what you do. Does anybody say discipline yourself? I need to tell you something. Your feelings are going to create a war path. And then once you're not mad anymore, you're going to have to go try to clean it up. The problem is who you wounded may not want to clean it up. So now you feel good, but now they hurt. It got quiet in the church. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You discipline your body. You make it do what it's supposed to do. You tell it what to do. Does this make sense, anybody? So when your body's like, you don't need that extra rep, you push it out. Come on, Coop. What you tell him, Coop? Raw, hoorah, something. Man, you better do that rep. <laughs> you know? Watch this, Christian people. Watch this, Harvest. And, 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 and did we get something good tonight? Did we get some good stuff? So when you go home, we reconcile to his word, divine our spirit, reconcile to his logos, reconcile to his rhema. But then create an environment. Some stuff in your house you need to take down. Why you still got pictures of boys men up on the wall? Apparently, this is all the uh, offenders over here because ain't nobody, or maybe all the offenders over here because ain't nobody's in them. Okay? All right? Why you still got, well, that's my, for my first husband, but why is it still up? You know what that reminds you of? Failure. Which is no wonder why you deal with everybody else the same way you deal with him because you align yourself with him. Gave to me. Well, now listen, either you learn how to accept gifts and detach the pe person from the gift. Uh, I got a book I'll write you on it and teach you how to do it. <laughs> or, hey, um, yeah. Makes sense, everybody. And align yourself. Everything in your home, everything around you is in alignment. Everything. Everything in there. So you got to change those alignments. Are you talking about I'm a new life, but you still listen to the old radio station? I'm meddling now because we off the CD. I'm just meddling. Here's the deal, Harvest. I want to see you surge. I want to surge. I want our church to surge. And people already are, but I want your surge to be so significant, so powerful so awesome and when people look at you they say there is amen everybody do you receive this word tonight now i want you to make this confession over yourself just lay your hands on yourself say in the name of jesus say your name my spirit my soul my body 
are in full alignment. My spirit is aligned with God's word. My spirit is unified and has control over my soul, which has control over my spirit, my body. In Jesus' name. I'm in alignment. Say it again like you believe it. Say, I'm in alignment. I have unity. And because of that unity, I'm surging. Give God your biggest praise if you would tonight, if you believe that word. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Real quickly, tonight if you're in this worship experience and you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, the first alignment you need to have and the unity you need to have is with Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, God stepped in the body. The body was named Jesus. The body paid the price so that you and I could have life. Secondly, if, you, if you've given your life to Jesus but you've fallen away from him, tonight's your night to reunite with him and step into unity with Jesus. And tonight, wherever you are, if you're here at the Royal Campus or you're watching online at Roku or Internet, wherever you're at, I want you to throw your hand up. And when you do, you're going to hear a bunch of us shouting and celebrating you for the new life that's going to come into your life. Say new life in my life. God makes all things new. He's such an awesome God because he's got the ability to take the messed up and make a message. He's got the ability to take a toe up and make a testimony. He just is God like that. And so tonight, if I was one of those as you, tonight, that's the first unity you've got to have with him. If you need to come a Christian, recommit yourself to Jesus. Wherever you are, on the count of three, throw your hands up. One, three, if that's you, throw it up. I see you. I see you. Oh, give God praise for these hands. I see you over here. Give God praise. We're so excited for you. We're so excited for you. We're so excited for you. Come on, Harvest. Thank God for the hands we can't see that are watching online. Glory to God. Now, every hand lifted, everybody say this to me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Because of that belief and because of that confession, if this is my first time praying this, I am a Christian. If I was far from you, I'm reconnected to you. Great days are ahead of me. I'm surging. I'm in alignment. I have unity within myself. My spirit is aligned with God's word. My spirit has dominion over my soul, which has dominion over my body. And because of that, there's a surge in my life. In Jesus' name. Come on, Harvest, one more time. Would you bless him if you love him? Glory to God. Listen, we're getting ready to give in just a moment. You can be seated for just a moment. Again, I did teach a little longer, but did you, did you get something out of it? Did you enjoy it? 